on this edition of Southern Newsweek. We remember a dark time in New Zealand sport and students flocked to the university to look at art, while at Dunedin High School adds more names to its wall of fame. Welcome to Southern Newsweek, I'm Daryl Bazer. It's 40 years since the South African rugby team played against Otago as part of the Springboks' infamous 1981 tour of New Zealand. Anti-activist John Mint, anti-tour activist John Minto visited the site of the former sports ground and paid tribute to those who marched against South Africa's racist policies. Former Dunedin boy John Minto is dismayed that Carisbrook, the sports ground where he spent much of his childhood watching both cricket and rugby matches, is now a pile of weeds and rubble. Well, I can't believe the whole <laughs> Carisbrook's gone. It was a big part of my growing up here in Dunedin. Um, I was here till, you know, I was born here and I stayed here till I was almost 13. My family went to Napier, but um, I spent so many Saturday afternoons here. Yeah, I can't believe it's all gone. Yeah. Minto was a leader of the group Hart, which stood for Halt All Racist Tours, and he opposed the way New Zealand rugby broke the sanctions in place against the racist nation of South Africa. By the time the tour reached Dunedin, there was a sizeable contingent of police and barbed wire to keep protesters away. There was a, early, a real flurry in Gisborne and, and Hamilton. We were able to get close to the grounds and in fact in Hamilton we were able to get on the ground and stop the game which had an enormous impact in South Africa. But after that um, the government poured enormous resources in to ensure that the, that the tour would go ahead. I mean Muldoon wanted the tour to go ahead because in the provincial margin electorates there was strong support for the tour. And so the resources were poured in and so the stadiums were turned into fortresses and it was very difficult to get very close to them at all. Minto says he was pleased with the number of people from Dunedin who marched against the tour. To arrive here in a, in a really big crowd uh, was great. We were, um, when I joined the uh, protest it was at the Oval, uh, back at the Oval. So yeah, I mean it was, a, it was a great day for Dunedin to say no to racism and I think so many people did. Minto was 28 years old at the time. Now at 68, he recognises that the tour actually helped people become more aware of the issues of apartheid and racism. I think we got people thinking much more deeply about what was going on in South Africa and, and racism in our own country. And I think South Africa and New Zealand are both better for having had the tour here. South Africa started dismantling its discriminatory policies in the 1990s and Minto is now involved with a protest group called Global Peace and Justice Auckland. There's unfinished business. That There's a big fight against apartheid or the apartheid policies of Israel against Palestinians and the big human rights organisations around the world are calling that out this year. So this year is the turning point. So we're wanting to highlight that and get New Zealanders behind the Palestinian struggle. In Dunedin, the South today. Education Minister Chris Hipkins is satisfied the government's $46 million investment in Mount Aspiring College's new teaching spaces, including a photo, studios and library. Hipkins visited the college and viewed the construction project being undertaken by Naila Love. Queenstown's Mount Aspiring College has welcomed Education Minister Chris Hipkins to the campus for a visit. The school's role is presently 1140, but with the government's $46 million expansion, Mount Aspiring will be able to cater for up to 1800 pupils. Because the decisions that we make in Wellington have an enormous impact on what happens uh, all over the country, including right here. When completed, the whare and new teaching areas are set to accommodate 32 teaching spaces between them. Minister Hipkins says it's significant growth. Uh, you can tell a lot about a school just by walking around and talking to the students and talking to the teachers and getting a feel for the vibe of the place. The school is being redeveloped to cater for a forecast future role of between 1,600 and 1,800 pupils as the population of Queenstown and the surrounding areas grows. And while the school is set to accommodate many more pupils, students say it's a bit cramped while the work is underway. 
Even the fact that we can't fit the whole school into the gym anymore, so we have to split into junior and senior assembly, there's been a large um, increase in the roll number here. I came from a school of about 3,000 in Auckland, and so coming here it felt like, oh, this is a smaller school. <laughs> but now that I've gotten used to it, I've, I've noticed that, like Meg is saying, um, having assemblies that are quite split off is quite different. Oh, I mean, nobody loves a temporary classroom, <laughs> and I think everyone from what I hear, everyone's really keen for the new build. Everyone's really excited for new changes, new buildings in the school. The project is part of the National School Redevelopment Program announced last year. And the work is due to be completed in the last quarter of 2022. In Queenstown, the South today. Four more names have been added to the Wall of Fame at King's High School in Dunedin. Among the new prestigious alumni are a pop singer and also a former All Black. Former New Zealand pop star Craig Scott visited King's High School yesterday for the unveiling of his name on the school's Wall of Fame. Scott, who was New Zealand's most successful pop singer in the early 1970s, says he didn't actually study music during his time at King's. I had a mate here, Alistair Waugh, who's passed away now, but he, he and I were great friends at King's. And he had friends at Bayfield High who had a band. So I used to sneak over there. So I didn't do music at all. A total of four names were added to the growing list of former pupils on the Wall of Fame, with another well-known name added yesterday being that of Highlander and All Black Ben Smith, who says his attendance at King's in the early 2000s set him up for life. Uh, King's helped me because I think we had a real good uh, range of uh, pupils that attended the school. We actually had a hostel then, hopefully we can get a hostel back up and going in the next few years, but um, we had guys that came from all around uh, the region, um, that came to King's High School, obviously some good local uh, kids that came along and uh, really set me up um, the way that the school uh, has a good balance and everything that's been done here sort of set me up for the rest of my life here. Yeah. And Scott says having his name on the wall means a lot to him. I've had numerous awards, as you're probably aware, in, in, in the music business. Um, and this one, this is it. This tops it all. This, like, this is just so cool to get this. After all of these years, it's a real honour. The school's rector, Nick McIver, says he hopes the wall will inspire current and future pupils at the school. To me it's very important our boys see these men and hear their stories and have that appreciation and, uh, and understand that it could be them in the fullness of time, coming back to the old school and, and being acknowledged for um, some worthy achievements. The two other names added to the wall were businessman Graham Sinclair and Judge Joe Anderson. In Dunedin, the South today. Long-running Otago University Students Association Art Week has been a showcase of a myriad of artistic styles. Organisers say this year's Week of Artistic Endeavours wrapped up with an exhibition and market held in the University of Otago's Link Building. Thousands of people flow through the University of Otago Link Building checking out the vast array of artistically created goods on offer. This Art Market Day is one of the highlights of the Otago University Students Association's Art Week and events coordinator Shannon Van Royen says it shows how much of a creative hub the university is. Yeah, yeah, there are lots of creative people around um, and again, like we have all sorts, we have some kids here selling their works that they've done to, for some pocket money, right up until like uh, people that have established businesses. We've even got uh, Blue Oyster, the art gallery on board as well, and they've come to display their work. So it's been pretty awesome to see what everyone's come up with. Maya Morrison Middleton and Tan Scott from Blue Oyster Art Gallery say art is an important part of everyday culture and their gallery is an excellent launching pad for budding artists from all walks of life. So I think it's really important for students to come and support those artists as they're graduating and venturing out of universities. Yeah. Artworks entered in the annual competition line temporary walls in the Union Hall with styles ranging from classical to highly contemporary. Amongst the art and craft stalls offering clothing, jewellery and much more is a selection of curiously shaped scented candles. 
Dunedin Cat Rescue were also holding a stall with a wide selection of items aimed at raising funds for the charitable organisation. I'm here representing Cat Rescue Dunedin Student Association um, and we have a stand here today at the market day and we're just trying to sell some of the various things that we make as students to try and support Cat Rescue Dunedin as a, as a charity itself. Amber Cost says this is just one way they raise funds for the cause. The OUSA's Shannon Van Royen says the week is all about celebrating the arts. In Dunedin, the South today. Still to come on this edition of Southern Newsweek. A woolen fashion show brings fashionistas to central Otago and an Olympic swimmer returns home. See you after the break. Welcome back. Woolen garments were modelled on a catwalk in the remote township of Terrace for the Wool On fashion event. The show had been in doubt until mid last week, when a last minute bailout from the district council helped the event get across the line. After being away for two years due to venue issues and infighting, Wool On was definitely back in central Otago for 2021, with the creative fashion event staged at a terrace vineyard on Friday and Saturday nights to a jam-packed audience. Loads of happy people and I think that's the biggest thing. Everyone's so happy and enjoyed themselves. Um, designers, uh, models, the models loved it. Everybody really enjoyed themselves and that's important. It's been quite a battle for Mary Hinson and her committee with an 11th hour bailout last week of $10,000 from the District Council in the hope the event will grow in the coming years. Hinson says they've already been approached by a number of people and businesses that want to help it become again an annual event. We're a new committee that never put on an event like this before, so it was a huge learning curve, um, but we did it, we got there and now we're going to take those learnings and we're actually going to, to learn, you know, to, to do things better. Yeah, make it, make it bigger and better. This year's Wollon featured a new category for repurposed items, which was won by Alexandra local Charlotte Hurley, who has been pretty much out of the fashion industry for the last 15 years. It's been a really long time since I did anything. Um, I left uh, fashion school in 2006 and I've not done anything in fashion or construction since 2006. Hurley's winning item was made from an old blanket she'd bought on Trade Me. In Terrace, the South today. Those looking to buy a home but on a tighter budget are in luck. Here's some good news. After 10 years of hoping to buy a new home, a young Wanaka couple have finally had their dream come true. But there's a catch. They own the house, but they'll never own the land. Here's the sky. Yeah. Here's the house. Here. Four-year-old Rory Vore has drawn a picture of his family's new house in Wanaka. A home which the rest of his family, including his parents, Kenny and Carrie Vore, are pleased to have moved into. We've been here now two months and we love our new home. We love our new home. It's the best place. <laughs> the family finally have their own home after having been renting in Wanaka for 10 years. With the median house price in Wanaka being about an unattainable million dollars, the couple were lucky to get one of six homes in the Hikawai subdivision that were earmarked to be affordable, costing them only about $500,000. The relatively cheap price is because they don't own the land. They are leasing that from the Queenstown Lakes Community Housing Trust at $100 a week with a lease for a hundred years. Karina and the Charitable Trust have been amazing. They have, uh, they, without them we wouldn't be here, so this is yeah, a dream come true. If the couple ever move, they won't make any capital gains from the increase in the value of the land. But they're happy to have a large home they can call their own in one of the most expensive parts of New Zealand. 
So it's a four bedroom. We've got um, a garage which is attached, which is lovely. We're just about two and a half kilometers from Monica and two and a half kilometers from Albert Town. And We've got a lovely big garden with lots of room for toys. Yeah. <laughs> Out of the six affordable homes at the Hikawai subdivision, there's only one affordable house left, which is two bedrooms for just under $400,000. In Wanaka, the south today. Young Dunedin swimmer Erica Fairweather is home. After two weeks in managed isolation, the 17-year-old Olympic swimming finalist and New Zealand record holder arrived at Mamona Airport this week. Arriving at Mamona yesterday afternoon, Olympic swimmer Erica Fairweather has touched down at home after her Olympic campaign, where she felt well supported by those back home. Yeah, absolutely. There was a lot of um, FaceTime calls and Zoom calls into class and with my family and amongst my teammates and my monkey, so it wasn't too bad. She says the scale of her accomplishments in the pool at the Tokyo Aquatics Centre has become clear to her after spending long hours alone in managed isolation on her return to the country. She says she's looking forward to a return to a mostly normal routine, but with greater expectations on herself. Go back to somewhat normal, but um, yeah, there's definitely more that heightened performance kind of expectations on myself now, you know, knowing that I can do that, um, yeah, just getting back to it really. Fairweather says Tokyo was just the start and her sights are firmly set on the Paris Olympics in 2024. In Dunedin, the South today. After the break on Southern Newsweek, it may only be August, but some are already planning for Christmas. And a Dunedin-based rally driver, Emma Gilmore, is about to race in a very cool part of the world. Welcome back. It may only be August, but a Wonka-based business is already preparing for Christmas. Creators of a reusable Christmas cracker hope to sell thousands of units ahead of the silly season, and they say theirs have a twist. A pre-Christmas business with a bang. Wanaka-based startup Waste Free Celebrations was born out of last year's lockdown, with Alistair and Emma Cunningham launching their sustainable seasonal business as the world began returning to the new normal. Everything is um, reusable and washable except for your consumable. New Zealand made, um, all supplied by um, little companies here in Otago, Southland and Canterbury, so supporting New Zealand businesses, and they'll last um, for generations. Every Christmas, thousands of plastic toy and bad joke filled crackers have their contents added to landfills across the country. Emma Conningham says they hope to capture 0.1% of the Christmas cracker market, saying every aspect of their seasonal bangers is recyclable and they're supporting other local businesses. These are all handmade items by um, local businesses, local craftspeople. Um, so it's real New Zealand businesses that are benefiting when you pull the cracker. The business and the crackers were both conceived from the couple's garage in Wanaka, and the pair are now employing staff. But Conningham says there's one thing which is just the same as the typical cracker. They're really bad, the jokes are really bad. Um, each refill kit will come with eight jokes that you just cut up and put into the cracker. Why has Santa been banned from sooty chimneys? Carbon footprints! New Zealand has imported $1.7 million worth of crackers around Christmas. The couple has the philanthropic goal of keeping Kiwis working and they hope to eliminate disposable crackers by the year 2030. In Wanaka, the South today. Kayakers filled one of the main pools at Oamaru's Aquatic Centre for the annual South Island Secondary School Canoe Polo Championships. Now in its eighth year, the event draws school teams from as far afield as Havelock and Invercargill. The Waitaki Aquatic Centre in Oamaru was bustling with young kayakers taking part in the annual South Island Secondary School Canoe Polo Championships over the weekend. Event coordinator Peter Anderson says the tournament, which is now in its eighth year, is a place for young players to hone their skills. In the South Island Canoe Polo is a very small niche kind of sport, but these kids love it and they're have been 
players from this tournament have gone on and are current members of New Zealand teams that have gone to World Championships. And some of them are, are back here in this tournament here today coaching teams from their old school. Anderson says the event, which this year attracted 18 teams from across the South Island, relies on assistance from a number of sources to keep going. We have a great spirit here and this tournament runs on an incredible amount of goodwill between all the different schools who compete and the officials and the pool staff and the local community who provide us with accommodation and, and, and sell us coffee and food during the day. After running the event for seven years, Anderson says that this will be his final year at the helm. In Awamaru, the South today. A Dunedin shoe repairer recently got a surprise when the building he was leasing was condemned and slated for demolition. Rather than closing down, he's moving to a new premises and says there'll be plenty of work waiting for him once he's up and running. Paul Ayres has moved his Dunedin shoe repair shop from Stewart Street into new premises at 166 Hillside Road. He says the move will be a change for him, but one that helps rekindle memories of his parents, who have both now passed away. I was at Stewart Street, I was my dad's apprentice, and I started there in 1975, so I've been there a long time. Yeah. So it's uh, certainly a, it's going to be different coming out here, but as it turned out, um, just across the road, on an angle there, um, used to be Mattingly's shoe repairs, and that's where my dad started his work. Oh. way back in the 40s and my mum worked at Godfrey's so that's how they met. So I've kind of come in a big circle. Yeah. <laughs> Ayers had to move out of the Upper Stewart Street shop at short notice when the landlord discovered recently that the old brick building is unsafe and has to be demolished. Within a few days after being notified I managed to secure this place so we did what we could and got a group of movers in to get that stuff out, heavy equipment and stuff, and um, moved it in on that day. So it worked out pretty good. He's confident he'll pick up plenty of work in his new shop. He says that once upon a time, practically every suburb had a shoe repair shop. When plastic became a major component in shoes, the public grew less interested in repairs. But in recent years, his business has started growing again. People are buying better quality footwear, I think, and wanting to have them for longer, and they're protecting them and keeping them in good condition. So yeah, I think it's, it's picked up significantly over the years. Ayers says that while his new premises are slightly smaller than his previous shop in Stewart Street, that's a good thing, because he'll be motivated to throw out some of his unused equipment. In Dunedin, the South today. Dunedin rally driver Emma Gilmore has stepped up to join Veloce Racing's team to drive in the Greenland Cross Prix. She vows to expect the unexpected at the unpredictable Extreme E motor racing event. Dunedin rally driver Emma Gilmore is a long way from her Dunedin car showroom, as she's about to be racing in the International Extreme E electronic vehicle racing event in Greenland. So I was signed as Veloci's reserve driver back in March and uh, their number one driver is Jamie Chadwick and she's currently leading the W Series which is an all-women series uh, formula racing. So I was uh, keeping a very close eye on her calendar uh, and looking for that first potential clash which was looking likely to be Greenland uh, but I was pretty excited when the team finally called me up and said yep you can book your tickets. So uh, yeah it's just so amazing to actually know that I'm finally going to be taking part in this really cool series. She's been called up by the Veloce Racing Team as their reserve women's driver. As the name suggests, the Extreme E sustainably takes driving teams around the globe, with Gilmore's drive taking place in Greenland within the Arctic Circle. She says there are many equality-driven aspects of the event which appeal to her. Probably one of the things that's most unique about it is that there's two drivers per team per car and one of them is male and one of them is female and we each do a lap each and our combined time racing effort is, uh, is, is what counts. The Arctic Cross Prix is the third event on Extreme E's inaugural 2021 calendar and while Emma Gilmore is well known as a champion driver on our side of the world 
and rates her chances. Especially with her male driver being Stefan Sarazin, she's under no illusion about the calibre of the other teams. Uh, it's a pretty impressive lineup of drivers. Uh, the, some of the male drivers are the likes of Sebastian Loeb, multiple um, world champion, and Carlos Sainz. So uh, you're rubbing shoulders with some pretty elite talent. Uh, I think for us, my uh, male driver is a French driver called Stefan Sarazen, and uh, you know I haven't driven the vehicle yet, so um, I'm just hoping that we have a good clean run, and then I think you know we have a chance of being on the podium, and that's definitely going to be the aim for the weekend. Team principal of Veloce Racing, Rupert Svensson Cook, says the team is delighted to give Emma Gilmore the opportunity to race with them in Greenland, and he says they were impressed with her abilities from the outset so signed her up as a reserve driver for just this kind of scenario. The e-vehicles are due to race in the Extreme E-Arctic Series on August 28th and 29th. In Dunedin, the South Today. And that wraps up this edition of Southern Newsweek. For the latest news from around the Southern region, head online to odt.co.nz and follow Channel 39 on Facebook and YouTube. Ka kite anō. Supporting local content so you can see more of New Zealand on air.